country. The descendants of slaves continue to build this. Slaves built this country. And if slavery was such a source of wealth, the American South should have been much richer than the North. It wasn't. According to one estimate, Southern per capita income in 1840 was just three quarters of the national average, and the gap had widened by 1860. There were a few very rich slave owners in the South, but remember, only one in four or five households had any slaves at all, and most had just a few. Frederick Law Olmsted, the man who laid out Central Park in Manhattan, spent five years studying and writing about the antebellum South. The myth about slavery is that with the threat of punishment, you could squeeze a fabulous amount of work out of a slave. That's not what Olmsted found. He estimated that slaves worked only about one-third the hours of a hired hand on a farm in the North. Another northerner, who studied slavery, wrote in the September 1849 issue of Debo's Review that it was a vain attempt to force the Negro to do even half as much as a hireling in New England is compelled to do. About one-third of the U.S. population lived in the South, but at the start of the Civil War, the North had 90% of the country's industrial production. The North produced 20 times more pig iron than the South, and 32 times as many firearms. Northerners were four and a half times more likely to live in towns of more than 2,500 people. In 1860, there were 321 public high schools in the whole United States. Guess how many there were in the South? 30. So where does this idea that slaves built America even come from? It comes from cotton. And it's true that leading up to the Civil War, cotton, almost all of which was grown with slave labor, accounted for fully half of all of America's exports. But in 1860, exports were just 6% of GNP, which means cotton exports were 3%. Does that sound like the driving force of the U.S. economy? Now, about this business about reparations, this is another thing that just gets me before we get to some of these other issues. Slavery enabled this country to become wealthy. This country was built on the backs of slaves. You hear this over and over and over again. Frederick Douglass, of course, was the famous abolitionist. He was born a slave and he escaped from the plantation he was on in Maryland and he escaped to New Bedford, Massachusetts, never having been to the North before. So he wrote a book called My Bondage and My Freedom. And in his book, he said he had no idea how wealthy the North was. In fact, before he escaped, he said he assumed that the wealth was poor because he did not believe any area, any nation could become wealthy without slavery. He thought slavery was indispensable for wealth. He said he was shocked when he found out that many people who were middle class and lower class in New Bedford, Massachusetts, were living better than most of the so-called wealthy people in Maryland where he was. Quote, Judge then, he wrote, of my amazement and joy when I found, as I did find, the very laboring population of New Bedford, Massachusetts, living in better houses, more elegantly furnished, surrounded by more comfort and refinement than a majority of the slaveholder, oh, slaveholders on the eastern shore of Maryland. Let me read that again. He's writing about how stunned he is about the prosperity of the North. He assumed the North was poor because the North, he knew, uh, was not slave, and he thought slaves were indispensable to build wealth. Quote, Judge then of my amazement and joy when I found, as I did find, the very laboring population of New Bedford living in better houses, more elegantly furnished, surrounded by more comfort and refinement than a majority of the slaveholders on the eastern shore of Maryland, close quote. He then writes about a man named Mr. Johnson, quote, himself a colored man, who, quote, dined at a Richard board, was the owner of more books, was the reader of more newspapers, was more conversant with the political and social condition of this nation and the world than nine-tenths of all the slaveholders of Talbot County, Maryland, where he escaped. And then there's this website 
called the National Park Service website. I assume it's a government website. And it's called Industry and Economy During the Civil War. And it talks about how much more prosperous the North was because it didn't rely on slave labor. Manufacturing better. Owners of more railroad uh, uh, tracks. Owners of more banks. Produce more cotton. Produce more textiles than even in the South. Produce more leather goods. More pig iron. More firearms. More uniforms. More materiel. Able to transport it more. And it was this huge industrial gap, superiority gap that the North enjoyed over the South that enabled them to win the war. And we'll put this article up on LarryElder.com as well. And it just talked about how the Southern economy was based upon slave labor, slave labor inherently fragile, and as the war progressed and as more and more the slave labor realized they were no longer going to be slaves, they became even less prosperous. Slavery did not help the South become prosperous. It made the South become less prosperous. It made the country become less prosperous. And don't get me started on the cost to the country of the war.